there is so much to be excited about. <laughs> I mean, Zen's launching, right? That's why you're you're watching this. New processor, Zen 4, Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. <gasps> I've actually got two full systems. Check them out. The new 16 core 7950X and the 12 core 7900X, both here in full force. I will review the other two CPUs, the eight core and the six core, in a couple of weeks, don't worry. So we're launching four CPUs today. I'm covering two of them. I'm sure you can find other channels that are covering the other two. Let's take a look at the specs. I've got a system here. It's a be quiet system. This is rocking our ASRock motherboard. And I've got our 12 core in here. And I've also got our ROG Crosshair Hero X670E and our Fractal system with our Fractal AIO and a Be Quiet AIO and that's what we're rocking for these two systems. We're also rocking G Skill Trident Z5 Neo memory along with some Kingston Fury Beast memory. Both running at 6,000 mega transfers per second which is the new sweet spot. DDR5 6000 natively supported with 65 nanoseconds latency. Yes. That's where we are. But let's take a look at the AMD specifications. How utterly mental is it that 5.5 gigahertz CPU clocks and beyond are the new normal? That's sort of where we are. I mean, it was just about 20 years ago, not quite, that we saw four gigahertz in a mainstream desktop processor for the first time. And now, now 5.1 gigahertz is effectively the all core boost clock on at least some of these desktop processors. Now the components that I've selected for these systems are pretty high end. I did go with an all-in-one cooler for both of them. We'll talk more about that. I've also got a 6950 XT for our primary GPU as well as an EVGA 3090 Ti. Rip EVGA. My heart goes out to you. Jacob, hope you're doing okay. This configuration is absolutely nuts. I mean, we've got a new configuration, new chipset, all the new revealed stuff about AM5 and AM5 is sort of here to stay. This is going to be one of the densest reviews that I've ever done and I'm going to try to go through the highlights here in this video so that it's not super long, but I've actually taken a deeper look at a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. So if you're sitting there saying, whoa, WTF, there's another video about that that's going to launch in a few days or actually they're already on Patreon of Floatplane. So <laughs> this is basically going to be the, the week of Zen 4, I think. I've got AMD interviews and going to take a really close look at uh, overclocking and eco mode and everything like that but there's also chapters for this video so you can jump around and see what's what's going on here and uh there is a complete rundown of linux over on the level one linux channel if you want to see how this new platform fares on linux and uh, spoiler alert it's pretty good i mean there's like five or six videos that are launching today on patreon and floatplane there's just so much to cover i'm gonna be your guide this week for all things Zen 4. Now with AM5 and Ryzen 7000, everything is different. I don't mean that hyperbolically. I mean, literally everything is different. AM5, PCIe5, DDR5, also new chip lithography, six nanometers, and just new recommendations for, for motherboard makers from AMD. So we'll see new motherboard features. It's a it's a new bar, it's a new set of standards. It's new stuff from AMD. Expo memory, what's Expo memory? This was a triumph. I'm making a note here, huge success. Gaming tests and productivity tests and real world tests and power management tests and even low power stuff is sort of all new and low power stuff really is addressed in a big, big way. This is a big launch. It's got big launch energy. It feels just like when AMD first launched Zen five years ago and the AM4 socket and everything else, except now AMD is five years wiser, five years richer. And I think they've poured all of that experience into the new platform based on what I'm seeing. No worries, let's strap in and get this thing going. Before we talk about the processors, let's talk about the new platforms. I've got motherboards here from Asus and ASRock and X670 Extreme, but uh, it's probably easier for me to draw you a picture. First, let's talk the platform, AM5. Today, you're gonna see X670 and X670 Extreme motherboards launching from a number of different places. And AMD has said that B650 and B650 Extreme motherboards are launching right around the corner in October. They told us October. So today we're gonna to focus on X670, but if you're wondering, B650 is right around the corner. There is no difference between X670 and X670 Extreme in terms of the chipset. It's how the motherboard maker implements it. Extreme means PCI Express 5. 
but in all cases, AMD is requiring at least one PCI Express 5.0 M.2 slot. For X670 Extreme, however, PCI Express 5.0 slots are also required. The main idea from IBM is to provide more high-speed USB connectivity, and most motherboards are eschewing lots of PCIe slots. The reality is that AMD and motherboard makers uh, I have an amount of flexibility there. They don't have to do that. They can do something else. Some of the first devices we're likely to see that are PCIe 5 are storage. And I hope to review some new drives from Fison and others that are gonna be native PCI Express 5. Uh, if you want PCIe 5 storage, you want low latency as well as throughput. And PCIe 5 is not necessarily gonna give it to us. The new Samsung 990 Pro, for example, is probably gonna be class leading in terms of latency but it's not PCI Express 5. Now let's break down the X670 chipset on the whiteboard. <laughs> it's five by five by five. We got our AM5 slot, our DDR5 memory, and then of course lots of PCIe Gen 5 connectivity. We actually have 28 lanes in total. Well, 24 lanes, but there's, there's four lanes that go to the chipset. All the connectivity on the CPU is PCI Express 5. The link from the CPU to the chipset, however, is PCI Express 4, and our X670 chipset actually links to another X670 chipset, or the chipset is two chips, and this is also 4.0. Four lanes by 4.0. This is for low-speed peripherals. But this is X4, X16, X4. Oh, I've drawn an extra one. Oops. Now, I asked why we couldn't connect the chipset directly to you know, the CPU, and that might have been their original intent, but it turns out this design actually helps eliminate the need for redrivers and some other things like that. On our Asus Hero X670 Extreme motherboard, for example, uh, well, you should check out the video review of that motherboard, but the PCIe layout that it uses is sort of unexpected. Now, this use of chipsets to leverage what would normally be required for redrivers is actually pretty clever. And if you look at our Asus Hero motherboard, for example, at the rear I.O., you'll notice there's a lot of USB-C connectivity. That's probably no coincidence. It's not implemented yet, but, you know, Thunderbolt 3 and 4 is only 40 gigabit. Guess what? PCI Express 5.0, a single lane, is 40 gigabit. So four extra lanes, you could connect that here. Also, the CPU has onboard graphics now, so these combo USB-C ports can also drive graphics, at least some of them. USB 4 for the display, plus all the extra USB bandwidth, plus everything else. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see a hypothetical PCI Express 5 bridge that will give us four 40 gigabit USB connections. That doesn't exist yet, but you can tell the planning for that is there. This actually gives you a lot of flexibility. You've got 16 lanes for the GPU. You could break that into by eight by eight for the Extreme Edition X670 motherboards again. So you've got two physical PCIe slots that are X8 PCI Express 5.0. Plus you've got two sets of four lanes that are also PCI Express 5 that usually are gonna go to an M.2, but it could go to other stuff. I mean, we could see some workstation class motherboards. Now you might be thinking, okay, this is PCI Express 4.0 by four. Isn't this gonna bottleneck? Well, in past motherboard designs, they would hang, you know, M.2 slots off of the chipset, and that could. If you're going to run a really high-performance PCI Express 4.0 M.2 and it's connected via the chipset, that's going to use most of your bandwidth to the CPU when it's in use. But when we're talking about USB, 10 gigabit Ethernet, that kind of thing, not really. I mean, this is 8 gigabytes per second both ways. A dual 10 gigabit adapter is only going to use 2 gigabytes per second. That's going to leave a lot of bandwidth left over for USB and literally everything else. So. In terms of bottlenecking, don't really see it because you've got all the PCIe lanes everywhere else. And if you do want to run a workstation class motherboard with lots of PCIe slots, there is at least a path for that in the future. If you're worried about all this PCI Express 5 stuff, don't worry about it. There's going to be PCI Express 4 motherboards that are more cost down. That's definitely in the pipeline. Just uh, give it a little bit. Not very long. Basically the blink of an eye. And that takes us to memory because that's DDR5. and. Infinity Fabric and everything else, DDR5, eh, it's all gonna go together. Now for the memory aspects of AM5, there are a lot of changes with this platform because it is DDR5 native. That means no DDR4 support. DDR5 5200 is the max non-OC supported memory speed, and that's just for two DIMMs, two single DIMMs. I think Joe said it best. 
when we thought of AM5, we, we wanted to make a next generation socket that would last, you know, multiple generations, just like what we did with AM4. And so, you know, we started literally with the DD, DDR5 inflection point. You know, to us, that was a hinge point of a much higher performance memory. Um, we're building a very high performance CPU. Um, you know, DDR5 brings, brings with it not just more bandwidth, that's what everybody sees on the surface, but it brings twice as many channels per DIN. That allows us to have twice as many references in flight, reduces loaded latency. Latency is always the, you know, the killer of, of any CPU. And so, you know, reducing that latency really allows the CPU to, to shine. I got to talk to all those smart AMD folks that actually worked on this, the engineers that physically built this. It's like, what was your rationale for this? Why does this, what's going on? DDR5 native from the ground up, it's pretty good. But the scariest thing that you need to know here is that with DDR5 and the way that these boards work, on that very first boot where your motherboard and your DDR5 memory are getting to know one another, oh, it does take a long time. It does what's called an, an initial training to try to figure out all the memory parameters. It's not just reading some numbers. There's a, an electrical dance that your motherboard and your memory have to do. And it can take quite a while, especially if you're gonna run 128 gigabytes of, of memory. Our ASRock system at least has a blinking LED that changes every now and then to let you know it's doing something. I tested different kits from 16 to 64 gigabytes in one to four dim configurations. Your mileage is going to vary with this, especially uh, with just regular DDR5 memory kits. Our Corsair DDR5 kit, which is a 64 gig kit across two DIMMs, it took a good solid two minutes to boot on our Asus uh, ROG Crosshair X X670E. And the DOCP profile, because it doesn't have an Expo profile, wasn't perfectly stable. I had to up the voltage and fiddle with the timings a little bit myself in order to get it stable. Speaking of which, Expo is a new feature from AMD. Expo was necessary because XMP is not really a truly open spec. AMC has said that they plan to publish the full timing and sub timing specs of Expo kits on their website, which should make comparison shopping a heck of a lot easier. And I just so happen to have some Trident Z5 Neo from G-Skill, which is Expo. Do the little Expo sticker. DDR5 6000 is the sweet spot that is a little bit of an overclock. And our test kit is DDR5 6000. 8 to 64 and the performance here, 65 nanoseconds, basically out of the box. You can do 62, 63 with a little bit of tuning. And that's pretty darned impressive for the very first thing from AMD that's gonna be DDR5. I mean, this is a pretty good kit of memory, but uh, you know, as Joe said. You know, with our transition to DDR5, you know, we, you know, we wanted to really, you know, also make a statement on overclocking. So we've come out with Expo technology We've got a large number of partners in the, in the memory community. What's really cool about Expo, it's all about optimizations for AMD. It's all about optimizations for AM5, Zen 4. Expo is, is really gonna allow gamers, you know, gamers that like to overclock, you know, to have you know, the best possible memory performance. It's really gonna allow Zen 4 to, to be fully exploited. And uh, if you're a gamer, you know, please grab Expo and just kick some butt in your games. Now, I also tried three other kits of memory one from G-Skill, that was a non-Expo kit, Team Group and Corsair, ranging from 6600 to 5200. And the best latency that I could get with manual tuning was about 60, 61 nanoseconds. But I'm not really sure that was perfectly stable. Running the slowest kit, a Corsair 5200, was also kind of interesting. I mean, it is 64 gigabytes, but it didn't really make a huge impact for gaming. I mean, you can check out Shadow of the Tomb Raider here, uh, you can see it doesn't make a huge difference. Okay, it can make a huge difference at lower resolutions with a really fast GPU, but that's sort of an absurd like real world test profile. Like you can make it make a difference in benchmarking, but real world, I don't think so. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. And if you're wondering about ECC, yes, it can work. I did a full test on that. Check out the video on the level one Linux channel because Linux is sort of where we can figure that out. Now all DDR5 has something called on die ECC. And on die ECC isn't the ECC that you're thinking of. You want sort of traditional ECC. You, you really want to check out that video if those things are, are interesting to you because I'll cover all that in detail there. And yes, some of these motherboards are working with DDR5 ECC. I was able to inject some errors and see some corrections. With that out of the way, let's talk about CPUs and the new CPU socket and the new mounting mechanism and 
all that. But the good news is just about every AM4 cooling solution that there is, is also physically compatible with AM5. Now for my testing, I'm gonna recommend a 280 or a 360 millimeter AIO minimum for both the 7900X and the 7950X. Gaming is more forgiving of a weaker AIO design or a weaker cooler design in general, but productivity is not. <laughs> CPU, uh, I mean, it does a good job of self-throttling and not crashing in suboptimal thermal situations, but uh, I also even tried the Ice Giant just for the lulls. And oh, oh boy, the Ice Giant for lulls really was lulls. It performs about as well as a really, really good 360. It's still not, you know, a lot of surface area for heat production. So the Ice Giant is not, you know, the immediate clear winner, but it is actually a really good cooler if you've got physically room for it. Now there is a caution here. Just because your cooler physically fits doesn't make it a good idea. AM4 didn't really use a ton of power. The AM5 socket is a power upgrade as well. I mean, you know, 220, 230 watts maximum socket power. The CPUs we're testing have a thermal design power of 170 watts, but you know, even the best in class Noctua D15 tower cooler struggled with these two CPUs, tapping out at 95 degrees C with our 7950X. Oh, also, these CPUs have built-in graphics. Yeah, it's RDNA 2, it's just two compute units though. That's not much, but it will drive up to four displays. It is technically DisplayPort 2.0, but it's very limited DisplayPort 2.0, and that you're not gonna be doing 8K and 120 hertz from the iGPU on these CPUs. And to be clear, the on-chip GPU really does not even rise to the level of an APU. It's meant for business productivity and troubleshooting purposes. That's about it. I mean, just two RDNA compute units. That's it. Don't, you know, imagine that you're going to conquer the world with that in terms of gaming. But it does enable some pretty nifty things. Remember uh, gaming on my Tesla, the video that, that we did at level one to show that you could game on a GPU that didn't have any physical outputs? That kind of applies here. Uh, the Radeon 6400 and 6500 that only have two physical outputs, if you put that GPU in your system, that GPU can accelerate the outputs that are built into your motherboard. So you can actually drive four displays, even though there's only two physical displays on that GPU because the displays will go out through the motherboard. Now, there are some limitations with that if you were going to try like a 6950 XT and try to game at 120 FPS and then try to use one of the USB-C outputs on the motherboard, that's probably not gonna work out super well for you because the high frame rate gaming, there still has to be a mechanism to transfer that video frame from the GPU to the onboard graphics. And if you're a laptop user and you don't have the physical hardware to do that, you you sort of already know what I'm talking about, but that's not an optimal situation. But hey, you know, 60 Hertz, 90 Hertz is probably okay. Our Asus Hero board here actually has multiple display outs through USB-C and that works great. So you can use the USB-C output, you can use it with USB-C to DisplayPort, you can use it with the USB-C Level 1 Text KVM, there's all kinds of really cool options. Now even though there's an iGPU and even though you could theoretically use that for acceleration and software like the Adobe Suite, the Adobe Suite has not yet been updated to take advantage of this hardware encoder. So if you're thinking, hey, it'll work like Intel QuickSync, uh, well, maybe someday, but that day is not today. For streaming, yes, you can stream with hardware encoding on the CPU, not using CPU resources, while gaming on your discrete GPU. Remember all the trouble and kerfuffle around Apex Legends because it was chewing up all your GPU to the point that you didn't have enough room for encode and it took them forever to fix it? Well, you can use your GPU on your CPU for encode. Those problems go away. That's pretty awesome. Let's talk benchmarks and performance. Now I've got a bunch of artificial and real world benchmarks. Everybody is dropping a ton of benchmarks, artificial, real world, gaming, a lot of cool stuff here. What I wanna get across is that for gaming, the CPU is never really the bottleneck here. It's actually really hard to benchmark at the very top end. Even when I ran a 3090 Ti at 720p, these CPUs have more headroom, they have more to give. And I don't really even recommend that. Like running the 3090 Ti at 720p is crazy. No one will ever actually do that in reality. 
It does maybe, maybe give us a preview of what it's gonna be like on next generation graphics. Cause it's like maybe somebody would wanna run 1080p at 500 FPS, maybe. In addition, the 6950 XT was, was also a dream on this platform. I mean, there's not really a CPU bottleneck here with either one of those GPUs, no matter what resolution you wanna run. But let's take a look at the results. All right, so our game benchmarks. Let me just preface this by saying, real world gaming is kind of what I focused on. And then I wanted to go back and sort of grab some gaming benchmarks to talk about it in a graph format, but subjectively. And the thing I was most impressed with was playing in PUBG because PUBG is usually kind of a stuttery mess and it was amazing, but that's 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 a conversation for another day. Keep in mind the two CPUs that I'm testing are the 7900X and the 7950X. The other thing that emerged from testing was that generally the 7900X was the better gaming CPU. And in the first round of benchmarks, there was like a 25, 30 frame per second difference at 1080p in games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider. It didn't seem like I was hitting 95 degrees C in gaming, but I just wasn't seeing boosts like I thought I should in games. So I ended up clearing the BIOS and repacing the CPU. Then after that, everything was a lot more in line. The performance between the 7900X and the 7950X was basically neck and neck in most games. So Final Fantasy, yeah, it's, it's basically the same performance. Cyberpunk, it's basically the same performance. Deus Ex Mankind Divided, not 7900X kind of boosts a little higher. I mean, it looks like on paper, the 7950X would actually boost higher and it will if you keep it cool. Now this is at stock. Keep in mind that with overclocking, you can turn on the curve optimizer and give, give it a negative offset. And then the 7950X will be neck and neck with 7900X. Borderlands 3, basically the same performance within margin of error. Shadow of the Tomb Raider also with those caveats, basically margin of error. 300 FPS with the 7950X, yeah, it's attainable, 1080p. You tweak the settings just a little bit and get over the hump to 300 FPS. I never would've thought that was possible with that game engine. Rift Breaker is the standout. Rift Breaker has had some optimizations specifically for the Intel platform. And the i9-12900K is no slouch when it comes to Rift Breaker. But still, the performance uplift from the 5950X to the 7950X is nothing short of impressive. For productivity, this thing is also an absolute beast. Cinebench R23 shows the 7900X to be nearly the same speed as a 32 core Threadripper 2990WX from just a few years ago. Ouch. That's just a fraction of the power as well. At stock, our all-core boost was 5.1 gigahertz. As long as we can keep that CPU cool. That was, that was a little tricky at times. For code compilation and workflows like that, check out my Linux video because you're probably using Linux there already. Uh, code compile, rendering, I mean, it's a pretty decent uplift depending on what you're doing. I mean, you can compile the Linux kernel now in like 30 seconds. Real world, there are some, some pretty good improvements. It's nothing super breathtaking for the code compile workloads, but it is dramatically good. I mean, you know, like 20% is pretty awesome. Gaming on this thing and using it as my daily driver for the last couple of weeks, it's pretty clear. I strongly recommend, even at stock, that you go with a 280 or a 360 AIO, and a good one at that. The best but not super expensive AIO was easily the 360 Pure Loop AIO from Be Quiet. The Fractal AIO was also a pretty good choice here, although I had to tweak the uh, the auto wasn't auto enough. I had to switch it to PWM mode and just max out the pump header and have the pump run all the time. But that was fine once I did that. With PBO and the Curve Optimizer, both of my chips could achieve 7900X and 7950X levels of performance, but at much less power than stock and with perfect stability. That means longer boosts. And while I could see up to 90 degrees C at stock with, with either one of those coolers in the heaviest multi-core workloads is what I'm talking about, gaming and regular workloads were much more reasonable, uh, especially with the Curve Optimizer. The Curve Optimizer really did a lot to make the chip not idle at a relatively high speed. So let's talk overclocking. Forget what you know about overclocking. The Curve Optimizer is the future of overclocking. This is covered pretty well in another video on Patreon and Floatplane. It'll probably be out in a few days. If this video is more than a few days old, it's, it's gonna be on the channel. But yeah, AMD says that the uh, max boost of the 7950X is 5.7 gigahertz. That's wrong. It's actually 5.85 gigahertz, as long as you keep the temperature under 50 degrees C. And the all-core boost, 5.1, 5.2, just depends. Every other review is gonna complain that it's impossible to keep this chip cool and you'll never see 5.8 gigahertz. What they're missing is that their chip probably will actually work at 5.8 gigahertz at much less 
uh, current, much less stuff through the screen. I mean, the operational voltage in this is 0.6 to 1.475 volts. And yeah, our TJ Maxx is still 95 degrees C. And the CPU normally operates from 70 to 90 degrees C under normal load. And AMD says, all oh, that's normal. That's just how it works. The thing is, why is AMD not advertising the 5.85 gigahertz capability of this chip? Well, not every chip is going to be able to do that. The story here is about the power required to achieve a certain level of performance. At stock settings, your CPU is probably going to consume more power than it needs to do a given operation, unless you've really, really lost the silicon lottery. Some CPUs will need that extra power to do their thing. So in all the millions of 7950Xs that are gonna be sold, some of them really won't hit 5.85 without generating a lot of heat, taking a lot of power. But most of them probably can. And that's the overclocking. That's where we get into talking about curve optimizer. So you can turn 5.8 into something less than a fleeting boost clock, especially in gaming scenarios, with a little bit of tuning with the curve optimizer and, and PBO. And yeah, this is single core, but what about multi-core? Well, the overclocking thing kind of apl applies there too. I've got a little bit more headroom uh, because I'm doing that. Now the six and the eight core parts, yeah, they're gonna be able to consume more power. Maybe you'll be able to deal with the heat a little easier. So maybe it's gonna be a different scenario. I'm gonna have to take a look at that. In terms of all core workloads or multi-core workloads, yeah, I could hit 93 degrees C with my CPU, but when I was doing that, you know, my stock performance was about 38,000 on Cinebench R23. Uh, with the overclock, yeah, more like 42, 43,000. And that's, again, with perfect stability because that's what Curve Optimizer really gives us. The bottom line, Ryzen Master and it's automatic optimized, it's good. It's actually a lot better than it has been historically. Well, Ryzen Master is a lot better than it has been historically but it still pays to spend 10, 15 minutes to try to dial things in yourself. That said, this platform, these CPUs have more overclocking headroom, at least overclocking as I've explained it here, than any prior AM4 desktop CPU that I've tested. The safeties in Curve Optimizer to keep you from you know, making your system unstable are really good, shockingly good. So that's quite an improvement if you're an experimenter. It's maybe a little bit more safety rails that you don't have to worry about. So when I saw this and experimented with this, my brain melted once again. This thing can run at a t thermal design power TDP of 65 watts and beat the performance of a 5950X. Holy crap. In summation, there's four flagship boards launching from each board partner today for AMD. AM5 is meant to be a long lived platform like AM4. And uh, if you want something that's long lived for your personal system, it pays probably to get one of those flagship launch boards. And also, you know, the B650 stuff's right around the corner. I mean, AM5 kind of has a lot of choices and it's sort of moving faster than you think because, you know, the next gen motherboards for the socket are gonna offer a lot, you know, USB 4 plus PCIe 5 and the extra PCIe lanes. I mean, you, you could really eke a decent workstation system out of this with all the PCIe connectivity if we see a motherboard that's going to do that. That said, AMD, you know, in their press release and when I talk about the gen on gen performance uplift and everything else, they have delivered on their promises. But more important than that, this platform, there's a few dots to connect, uh, you know, a few, few lines to draw that really point to some incredible things for the future. I mean, how long has it been that we've seen a CPU move up 500 plus megahertz? You know, the, the, the minimum speed in the CPU is higher than the single core boost last generation. And yeah, a lot of the performance improvements come from the dramatically increased clock speed, but there's a new front end design and there's new stuff under the hood in Zen 4 that really help with a lot of things. I think that this platform is really going to shine when we've got next generation graphics for gamers and, and everything else in terms of uh, CPU and really super CPU heavy things. While the 7950X is a, is a darn impressive CPU. Uh, there is, I think, a little bit more clock headroom on the 7900X. The 7900X might be a better choice for gamers. Uh, time will tell. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been the launch video for the AM4 platform. Thanks to AMD for sending over the uh, ASUS motherboard and the CPUs and uh, G-Skill for the Trident Z memory. Had a lot of fun with this platform. Got a lot of videos coming out. Be sure to check those out. You can join us on Patreon or Fullplane or whatever. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. If you have any questions or anything, I'm hanging out in the Level 1 forums. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.